Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2022 of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. We have received apologies today from Annie Wells and Mark Griffin. And I would ask all members and witnesses to ensure their mobile phones are on silent and all other notifications are turned off during the meeting. First item on our agenda is to decide whether to take items three and four in private. Item three is consideration of the evidence that we will be hearing this morning on, affordable, on the affordable housing programme during our pre-budget scrutiny. And item four is to consider our approach on the levelling up regeneration bills legislative consent memorandum. Are we all agreed? Agreed, thank you. Now we turn to agenda item two, which is to take evidence as part of this year's pre-budget scrutiny, which is focused on affordable housing provision in Scotland. And we're joined, joined in person for this session by Professor Ken Gibb, who's the director uh, at the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence at the University of Glasgow. Aaron Hill, who's the director of policy and membership from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and Fiona Kell, who's the Director of Policy at Homes for Scotland. And we're also enjo joined online, I can see you all, I think, yes, um, by Elsa Rayburn, who's the Chair of the Community Land Scotland, Sharina Peake, who's the Acting Policy Manager of the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, Mike Callaghan, who's a Policer, Policy Officer from Communities Team, at COSLA and Gary Fairley from Midlothian Council, who's the Director of Corporate Services, who is also appearing on behalf of COSLA today. So welcome. I'd now, um, I'll now open up the session to questions um, from members, and I'll begin by asking... Um, yeah, so I'd like to ask, begin by asking about national targets and outcomes. So I'm interested to hear from panellists. Well, actually, just before I dive in, a little bit of housekeeping in terms of how we'll do this. So what we try to do because of time is that members will possibly direct their initial question to somebody. But if you want to come in, please just indicate to myself or the clerk, or if you're online, indicate in the, uh, the, the uh, chat function with an R. Um, so now, now we've got that. I'll back to the questions. So... Um, yeah, so on national targets and outcomes, do panellists think that the Scottish Government target, targets um, for housing needs and outcomes are clear? And furthermore, do these targets uh, need to be re revisited? And I'd like to start by asking Mike Callaghan um, and then Professor Gibb and Sharina Peake. Mike. Oh, can't hear um, you. There we, there we go. Yep, can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think in, in respect of national targets, um, our position was that um, we, uh, organisation COSLA, were very supportive uh, of the construction build of affordable housing, where we got a common position with the Scottish Government in respect of the, the delivery of it across our local communities across Scotland. Um, it's my understanding, going back from the past, that we weren't particularly involved in actually establishment of national targets with the, the Scottish Government. Um, as far as I'm aware of, um, the rationale for it, um, we haven't been clear on that and, and from our perspective on how that was developed. Uh, we've always had an issue uh, with some of the, the, the rationale uh, for um, the Scottish Government's affordable housing uh, supply programme targets in respect of uh, COSA leaders uh, at the end of last year in November were quite unanimous that um, we felt that the benchmarking framework and the differential between um, local authorities and RSLs should be eliminated. Um, we think it's uh, unfair and also it passes a burden of it. Uh, potential increases in rent on to our tenants. Uh, I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, for example, in the Highlands and, and, and Islands, the construction house can, uh, houses can cost local authorities up to about £12,000 more than it is from the RSL sector. So I think this is this is a real impediment to local government, and, and it's something that we would have uh, much preferred working in partnership with the Scottish Government and having a, a joint discussion in respect how to develop uh, targets for the affordable housing supply program, some of which we are 
you know, we're very committed, very supportive of. Um, but clearly now, even since uh, the end of last year, when it was discussed at Cause of Leaders, um, the, the the macroeconomic f the, the facts have changed so much in terms of inflationary pressures, cost of living increases, um, as well as supply chain um, factors, which the cost of materials, everything, a whole range of factors have changed even more. So that's a need for more joint discussion in terms of how we um, establish targets realistically, as well as uh, taking into account the decarbonisation agenda as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Ken, what are your, what are your thoughts about the targets? OK, thank you. Uh, I should start also by declaring an interest as well. I'm, I'm a committee member of Shelter Scotland, just so it's out there. Thank you. Uh, in a sense, that the overall target is slightly odd than the national target because it, it, kind of without, it kind of relies on the research that's been done, the national affordability needs uh, assessments, which there seems to be a very strong consensus around, and that, that's the kind of starting point where... The, the discussion goes, and, and to that sense, uh, to the extent that one ex accepts the methodology, the way it's done, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable way to approach this. It's very much the way it's done elsewhere, and it uh, has a long lineage attached to it. I think uh, there's two things I'd say. One, in, one in, in actually amplifying what Mike's just said. Uh, I think uh, there's always going to be issues about the, the level of the proportion that goes to social housing and the proportion that goes to affordable housing. And again, there's a kind of consensus around the 70-30 split. But actually, uh, I think, in a sense, once that's made, then the funding kind of falls on behind that. And it's actually, we're maybe going to talk about this later on, but it's actually, there are trade-offs if you're going to make changes to it. Because if, if there's a funding envelope, then you know that's what you have to work with. So there's going to be implications of that. The, the other thing I think I'd say is, and to amplify what Mike said, I think is that uh, the, a really critical factor is clearly the benchmarking. And I think there are good things about the benchmarking outcomes, increasing the, the levels of grant across the board and narrowing that division between RSLs and, and local authorities. But the dis division still remains, and it still seems to be premised on things which aren't really evidenced in a satisfactory way. I mean, I think uh, if we go back to 2011, you know, a long, long time ago, we had this financial capacity study in Scotland, which was very controversial, but actually, in principle, a really important piece of work. And what I said in my written evidence was, I think, it really behoves us to have a externally transparent, accountable financial capacity study to at least evidence the, the, the positions that councils and housing associations find themselves in. And more than that, it needs to be disaggregated to pick up exactly the points Mike's been making about specific places. Thanks very much. And uh, Sharina. Good morning, everybody. Apologies for the camera this morning. Um, so uh, your question there is about clear targets. I think that the target is clear. Um, do they need to be revisited? I, I think potentially yes. Um, my colleagues have kind of set out some of the issues that we're seeing at the moment. Obviously, we have to um, achieve 70 percent of affordable housing by 2032, which is not very far away. And given that the um, economic situation that we've been finding ourselves in and will continue our find ourselves in is not changing. It means that the continued pressures for um, high construction costs, uh, supply chain issues, now with uh, decarbonisation, we've also got the added issue of what does that supply chain look like and the skills and workforce available to install, manage and maintain air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps and the likes. Um, a, a labour market that there's very few people that seem to be in it, so we're all kind of fighting for the same labour to come onto each of the different sites. Um, and then all of those costs are just adding up and adding up. So on average, the cost at the moment per unit is well over two hundred thousand um, pounds, which is unaffordable and unviable for lots of projects for local authorities. Um, Mike touched on the point there about RSLs and local authorities uh, having the benchmarks aligned. I think that that is definitely needed. The cost is not any different to an RSL building or a local authority building. So we're all in the same 
um, situation. We're all trying to deliver the target, and I think it should be fairer that um, local authorities are, are given that additional um, benchmark to bring them up. Those would probably be the points that I would like to make on that. And, and, and more importantly, what we need to remember is that whenever there are an additional cost to be met, that will essentially get passed on to tenants. And we are building affordable and social homes. So we need to remember that not all of our tenants will be in a position to be able to absorb high rent increases. And we need to also bear in mind that we're about affordable rent. So we have to manage that line really carefully. Our duty is to our tenants. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> um... I'm going to move on to um, another question, um, which is kind of connected a bit to some of what's already been brought up. But um, so we, in our call for evidence for this meeting, we received um, a comment from a few councils that suggested that the current subsidy system does not allow councils to fully meet the housing need of those with particular needs, including wheelchair users. And I'd be interested to hear um, if there are, if anyone is aware that there are some housing needs that are not being addressed, and if so, how could this be improved? Um, and uh, maybe Aaron, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll come to the specifics in terms of those with with additional needs in a moment. I think colleagues have already touched on the danger here of the overall de deliverability of the program, um, and and I think that threatens all types of housing at, at this stage. Uh, Shireen has just talked about the, the cost increases that local authorities have seen. We, we surveyed our, our members um, a couple of weeks back now, and they're reporting that over the last year, the cost of developing a home has increased by an average of 17%. Um, that's just in the last 12 months, and the 12 months prior to that was, was pretty similar. So, you know, over the last two years, we've seen the average cost of, of building a home go from 150, 160,000 to, as Serena says, more than 200,000 in many instances now. Um, and that, that varies by location in the highlands, islands, rural areas. We know that that is, that is much more acute. Um, driven by supply chain issues by inflation so i think the question is is can we deliver can we deliver housing needs generally um and and if we can't do that then we're going to let down we're going to let down a lot of people you know that particularly those with with the highest needs i think when it comes to those with additional needs wheelchair access those sorts of things i think the grant the grant system is is fairly flexible um and allows for that i think probably where we could see improvements is is in identifying that need further down the line um, sorry, earlier, earlier down the line, we've been we've been waiting for a number of months for Scottish government's review of, of housing for those with with varying needs. Um, that that's faced a number of delays because of issues with you know, with Ukraine, the work that's going on to to rehouse refugees, issues with COVID. So it would be good to see that move forward, and we can really kind of get into the into the detail of some of those questions because I think that's driving a lot of the, that uncertainty right now, and um, and it would be good for that review to to, to begin. Thanks very much. Is there anyone else who wants to come in on that particular question? You don't have to. Sharina. Thank you. So um, just picking up on Aaron's point there, the housing for varying needs is a, is a policy that really could do with getting brought forward and being reviewed. I think it would definitely help to make sure that that is included in part of all of our new builds. Um, at the moment, we are, or local authorities will be delivering at least 10% of their new builds as fully wheelchair accessible homes, ground floor, which is brilliant. Um, but the problem is that we are not always able to build larger homes. So where you've got a family um, that needs to have a, a ground floor home, we're probably not building anything beyond a two bed, which again means that not everybody who has those specific needs is getting that need met in terms of their housing provision. Um, we also do a lot of work with our colleagues in health and social care um, to make sure that their uh, service users are also getting allocated some housing in new builds. But that becomes really difficult to do because they don't have sufficient funding to be able to come in and um, have core and clusters on a new development. So it, it's about aligning all of those fundings and making sure that when we're building, we're building holistically and we're making sure that multiple service users' needs are being met. Um, even just an example of, of bariatrics, that's reinforced floors, it's widened doorways, um, all of those types of things. Those all need to be considered much further forward in the design stage. But then that's an additional cost. And who does that fall to? Should it be health and social care? Should it just be 
part of new build homes that they are built to this standard. So I do feel like um, the housing for varying needs would help to kind of set out whose responsibility it is and, and what level of need we're building to and future proofing to. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. that those are very useful points, actually. Um, I'm going to move on to um, another question that's around kind of place. I'm going to direct this to Ken and Ailsa. So many communities in the Highlands and Islands have suffered historic underfunding, as we've kind of started to hear, and forced depopulation, leaving them fragile and with declining populations. It's crucial that we support these communities and create communities that where people feel ownership. So with this in mind and the emphasis on the importance of place in the Scottish Government's Housing to 2040 policy document, is there anything the Scottish Government and its partners need to do to ensure that new affordable homes are developed in sustainable places where people actually want to live, or I would say actually in a sustainable way as well? So Ken, maybe you want to pick that up. Yeah, I, I don't have as much to say about this as I probably have to say about other things, but I would make two points, I think. One is that there's a 10% target, isn't there, within the housing affordable supply programme that's targeted towards rural, yeah. remote and island uh, areas. I think the issue is, I mean, it's issues to do with a lot of things, and there's a lot of broader r r rurality things, I guess, that would be important here. But I think the point I would make primarily is that, and this is a, a broader point, but it has specific rural dimensions, which is the worrying uh, reduction in the SME building sector, mm -hmm. uh, which is particularly important in a rural context because you simply won't get larger builders uh, taking part in those kinds of smaller programmes, which, which where, where the small size is, is kind of really important to what's trying to be achieved. So I think it's a, it's a place where the government might want to consider, given its, its uh, objectives and its outcomes around r rurality, that it might want to think more about what else it can do to support the SME sector. I think I quoted a number from Inside Housing that said across the UK there'd been a 70% plus increase in bankruptcies amongst house builders. So, really? And, and that's particularly aimed at the SME sector. Thanks for that. And I think, do we have Elsa? Yeah. Elsa, would you like to come in on that question? Yes, thanks, Chair. Sorry, I missed a, a little bit of your question, but um, I can, I can hopefully give, I, I've, I've I got can give it again if so you want. In terms okay. of yeah, developing. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, so I think in terms of, of sustainable places and addressing the really serious issues of population in, in targeted areas across the Highlands and Islands and in the south of Scotland, which we mustn't forget at all, which is also experiencing depopulation in, in rural communities. Um, I think this is where community-led um, uh, rural housing really comes to the fore, because um, communities that are in charge of, of, of developing housing to address these particular issues take a really holistic view of the problems. Um, so we've seen in places like Strontian, um, the um, housing is linked to school, so they've they've actually developed a new school together with housing um, in Alba Ferry on Mull. Um, the depopulation again was very much linked to the school role, and they focused on developing housing to attract new families. Um, so I think in terms, of, are, are we building homes, or are we building communities and places? Um, it's a it's a really important point for the affordable housing program um, that it is able to take that more holistic view um, that smaller numbers are more appropriate um, in very rural and remote areas, and are perhaps at a level that RSLs and local authorities are not able to intervene at. There's issues around land supply, again, which communities can perhaps unlock in different ways to RSLs and local authorities. Um, Community-led regeneration does look at those broader issues and, and the point that Ken was making there about contractors. I know some communities are now looking at building their local contracting base um, on egg. Um, we're trying to um, support local suppliers and contractors to upskill so we start to bring back that base of very small SMEs. Um, HIE, I know, are looking at modular construction um, and the opportunities for that type of um, construction approach, in particular rural and remote areas, and that's worked quite well um, at all the ferry on Mull. But I think there's a range of range of opportunities at the moment, and it would be good to be able to bring those together and share them more widely and ensure that they are supported to achieve this broader and um, place-based approach to regeneration. 
rather than just housing. Um, I've also mentioned that, you know, communities, when they're looking at housing projects, will bring other types of services, whether that's health services or schools or community hubs. Um, again, because they have access to the sorts of funding um, regimes that perhaps the other suppliers in the sector don't have. I think those, those are the points I want to make around place-based regeneration and, and community-led in that they're more flexible and have access to different funding regimes. But on the, on the downside, it is a really complex um, approach. The communities do need support, which is why the role of the, the rural housing enablers is really important give communities those technical skills and capacity. Um, and just a, a point on the, the targets and how that's working. Um, Ken did mention the 11,000 rural um, housing target um, that's in the plan. Um, but if all those are um, you know, around large um, communities at the moment in the rural areas, um, a thousand houses in Inverness is great. It addresses a lot of the issues there. Um, but a thousand houses in the Northwest Highlands across a hundred communities um, or 150 communities would be absolutely transformational for rural Scotland. Um, so I think the nuancing in the target is really important as well. And I think it, at the moment that's not being addressed. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Elsa. That's, that's really useful. Um, thanks for your insights. So we're going to move on to another theme. Oh, no, sorry. We've got two more people who want to come in. Sorry. So Aaron wants to come in and then Fiona. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I think for, for me, it really... It's, it's really interesting that we're talking about place and sustainable places, I, and I think really positive that we're doing so. Um, two quick points I would make: um, if if we are going to if we are going to move the move the dial on this, we need to start seeing housing as infrastructure um, and joining it up with other infrastructure of national importance. And I think we've missed an opportunity in in NPF four to do so. Um, not not listing housing as, as something of national national importance when it comes to infrastructure is is a missed opportunity. Um, on the positive side, I think. Um, if you look at the, the work that's being done in, in the south of Scotland around economic development there, there are organisations that really get this. And the South of Scotland Enterprise Group, the, the work that they've done on that economic vision really talks about the importance of housing in thriving rural communities and in, and in places where depopulation is happening. You know, I've heard the chair of that organisation say that my economic vision will only be as good as the homes that people live in. Um, and that's been driven by, you know, organisations like Eildon, like Berwickshire Housing, like, south, um, like Scottish Borders Housing Association, being at the table and being involved in those. And I think that's, that's the way that we can transform this discussion, discussion, is making sure that housing is at the table for these economic discussions around place and around infrastructure. Thanks very much for that. Can I just check with you? I think that's a really important point about housing being an infrastructure and, and that the draft NPF4 had a, it was a missed opportunity. Did you, did you put that in in the, in the kind of consultation because it was a draft and we're going to be, you know, we, we never know what might come through in a few weeks' time? Yeah, we've, we've said that in our response. And I think, I think overall, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be opportunity to talk about NPF4 later. But the, the disappointing thing is that NPF4 should be driving from a planning perspective, the, strat the, the other housing strategies that we've got out there, like Housing to 2040, and, and as it stands, we don't see the linkage between those two documents as, clear, as it, clearly as it could be. Okay, thanks very much. Fiona. Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, just to echo exactly what, what Aaron has just said about NPF4, um, it, it was pleasing a couple of years ago, the um, Scottish Infrastructure uh, Commission did identify housing as a as national investment, um, but it, it was definitely a missed opportunity not to see that in NPF4. But what I just wanted to pick up on was, um, in particular, was the issue around the SMEs. Um, work that we've done with our members um, recently indicated that around about 35% of all new homes that are built in Scotland are built by SMEs. But what we also know is that um, the number of homes built by SMEs in 2019 was about 2,000 less homes than was delivered in pre-2007 before the, the last crash. Now, if we see the same impact um, coming as a result of the, the looming um, recession and economic conditions that we mm. find ourselves in now, then I think we're in really serious trouble with the SMEs. Um, and we already know a number of um, SMEs have approached us and, and other similar bodies and um, that they are experiencing real difficulty um, in delivering affordable homes in rural um, communities in particular, um, and a number of them, their um, ongoing business viability is, is under threat currently <coughs> as a result of this. So this is not something that's, that's coming. This is something that, that's sitting with us at the moment. So I think as a priority, looking at the support for SMEs should be, should be very high on the agenda. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Can I just check? So the, <clears throat> when they come to you with the, you know, expressing this challenge of delivering, is it, is it the usual things that we've started to hear over and over again around l lack of labour, 
people with the skills and also the material costs? Yes, ab absolutely. I would say particularly <coughs> cost um, at the moment um, and also also labour. It's it's affecting everyone across the board, um, but the SMEs um, who maybe have a tighter cash flow position than some of the larger home builders yeah. um, will will find it much more exacerbated. Okay, great, thanks. And now, Sharina, you would like to come in as well. Yes, thank you. So I, I think um, the points that have been made have been really, really good, and, and the points about the SMEs. We have to also consider that place is more than just building it and leaving it. It's sustaining it, and it's managing and maintaining it. So when we're looking at all of the different parts that go along with building communities, sustainable urban drainage, green roofs, blue roofs, decarbonisation, all of these types of things, these all require ongoing management and maintenance. And for my colleagues who are in um, the Highlands and Islands, even being able to get somebody to come out and fix an air source heat pump that's broken can take days and days and days or weeks and weeks because if that um, energy company doesn't have other work to do on the island then they're kind of looking at it like well there's what's the the cost benefit of going out and doing one job it's better to wait for there to be a few more jobs but that does not help the communities where people are living when they need the repairs and the maintenance to be done so I think it needs to be much more joined up and more responsibility put onto the energy companies to say, well, actually, the Highlands and Islands are as much a part of um, the mainland of Scotland and the duty and making sure that you're out and able to um, take care of the products that you install is needed. And obviously, we can't really push that from our end as local authorities or RSLs. That needs more of a push from maybe government or, or other governing bodies. Thank you. Thanks, Rina. Now, that kind of points back to what Ailsa was bringing in in the beginning, where she was talking about the need for a much more local base, uh, as she was describing as happening on egg. And Ailsa, you'd like to come back in. Uh, thanks, Chair. Actually, it was just to, make, just to make that very point that actually how we support those SME local communities is absolutely critical. Recognising the geographic remoteness of a lot of these places, the point that Sharina was just making there um, in terms of getting contractors out is really difficult. So, um, you know, you'll find that people tend to go for the traditional models that they know the, the guy down the road can fix. Um, and that absolutely um, takes out of scope a lot of the, the new approaches that we all want to see happening on housing development. So support at a very local level for SMEs, but through the enterprise agencies or other organisations and through organisations like Skills Development Scotland and in schools is absolutely critical. You know, that's a long term, but we need to start now. OK, great. Thank you very much. So now we will move on to the next theme. And I just want to say we have um, quite a few other questions to, to, to get through, um, but some of them are directed specifically to, to some of you. So the next theme is progress in delivering affordable homes and balancing priorities. And I'd like to invite Paul McClellan with a, a few questions. Yeah, thank you, convener. And uh, this is really talking about, as I said, progress in delivering affordable homes and balancing priorities. And the witnesses have referred to the need for social landlords to balance investment and decarbonising their own stock and investment in new homes. And Professor Gibb, I remember your session here when you talked about the cost. I think, I think if I'm right in saying it was about £32 billion. And I'm thinking about more local authority in the share it is, you're talking about six or £700 million pounds over any slow day, roughly, in terms of what the challenges would be in looking at that. I suppose it's how, what, how can both aims be achieved and how can the Scottish Government use its budget to facilitate this? Um, and what way can look at is it increased resources? Is it prioritising one aim or another? Or can anything be done differently? And I suppose one of the questions for me as well is that at what level is that scoping being carried out by each local authority or each organisation? I'll probably come to yourself, uh, Aaron, uh, in the first regard, and then probably speak to Mike on, and Gary and, uh, from, from COSLA in that regard. Um, I've had previous discussions with SFHA about this as well, and I know this is an issue. That they've been uh, looking at. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's a really significant issue, and I think ultimately housing associations. The starting point is housing associations want to be able to deliver both of these ambitions. They're the right thing to do for the communities in in, in which we work. Um, but doing so at the moment in the current cost, current inflation, um, and economic environment is really really difficult. Just to take it back a step in terms of kind of how housing associations are financed, because this is really, really important. When we when we build new homes, about 50% of the costs are covered by private lending. Um, and that private lending is based on a return on the additional rent that is built from, the, from those homes. As it stands, the work to bring, bring existing homes up to standard through decarbonisation doesn't have an obvious revenue output. So 
there is no clear sight on where additional revenue will come into the business. So the assumptions that have been made previously by government and by others cannot, simply cannot be applied to decarbonisation. So we know that this can't entirely be paid for by, by Scottish Government. This is going to be a partnership with the private sector, private lenders, with you know, probably some new lenders that we've not worked with before. But we haven't yet worked out with government what that split is. Um, and that needs to be done so done so urgently. There's a huge amount of uncertainty about around this at the moment because we're reviewing the or Scottish Government are reviewing the energy efficiency standard for social housing. So we don't really know what standard we're building to. We're waiting for interim guidance on what should be done while that review is ongoing. Um, and that means that the work that is needed to bring in the right skills, to, to bring in the right materials. Um, can't be done until we have that certainty. So we've got a looming, a looming target in 2032, but with now another year of lost time where we're not going to know exactly what that finance ar arrangement looks like, exactly what that standard looks like. And so the pressure is only going to grow over the next decade on housing associations to do so. I think just, just to make a final point, there are, there are finance models out there. So Energy Sprong in, in the Netherlands um, has, has been delivered successfully in, in a number of places. The Future Generations Commissioner in Wales has, has put out a, a really interesting kind of framework for how this, this could be done. Every single one of those models requires significant government investment way above what is currently being invested. Um, and to not bring that forward will mean that housing associations ultimately don't have the capacity to deliver on decarbonisation. The trade-off, if we're going to de deliver decarbonisation without that government support, will be that we don't build enough homes. So there's a lot of work to do. We've been calling on Scottish Government to, you know, to run a sector capacity assessment on this. Um, that was done as part of the work on Zest, and, and we're still pushing for that. We've, we've seen some positive movements from the Zest report in the last couple of months, but it would be good to see that be, that be brought forward. Alan, thank you for that. And I'm going to probably bring in uh, Gary and, uh, and Mike and see the best person. To, the, the, I suppose one question is in terms of the scoping work that's actually been carried out. Or, uh, do you find your members have done that detailed piece of work to say this is how much it's going to cost in terms of, you know, if it is over that certain period of time? Because obviously the house of stock is going to be of different quality. And, and, and whatever as well, but I don't know how detailed that work has been carried out by the, the Federation at this stage. Yes, yeah, so it will vary from member to member, to, to be honest. Um, you know, I think the starting point is we're building from the highest, we're building from the highest standards in Scotland, so we know that you know, the, the, the gap we have to bridge is smaller than many other parts of the housing, housing world. Um, but that, that work is progressing varying speeds. The, the net zero heat fund um, provided by Scottish Government had, uh, had a channel for that sort of research. Yeah. Um, and bids have gone in for that. We're waiting to hear back. We know that it was massively oversubscribed. Um, it's very difficult to do that scoping work and to have that certainty over costs while the review of each is ongoing. Yeah. Um, and that, that review is a positive thing. We need to get that standard right, but it just adds uncertainty to the, to the equation. Um, thank you for that. Mike, Gary, I, I don't know who the best person to speak from, from a cause point of view. Just the same kind of question, obviously, from, from local authorities' uh, aspect in terms of how are local, uh, local authorities balancing the needs for, obviously, looking at um, decarbonisation and also building new housing stock. I don't know who the best person is from Causa Point if you come in on that one is. I'll, I'll maybe start some initial uh, comments on, on that. It's a very good question because I think there's um, quite some immense challenges. I mean, I mentioned a, a leader's position at the end of last year, but there's so many new challenges, which, uh, as I said, with um, you know, Ukrainian ar arrivals to our, our, our country, um, as well as inflationary pressures um, on, on supply chains and the cost of mat materials. Um, and as, as Aaron rightly said, um, decarbonisation, uh, energy efficiency of housing stock, um, each two is, is not optional. It's something that we'll have to strive for our housing stock, and, and it's something that. We have a number of challenges uh, that we are presented with in respect of affordable housing. And I think really to maintain uh, good progress is, is a need for um, a sort of reflection, a, a, a time to really take, take into account with ourselves, Scottish Government and other key stakeholders of, of how we take this forward um, and have a better balance and alignment of Scottish Government priorities. Clearly, we, we agree with the fact that we want to create more affordable housing for local communities across Scotland. Uh, but at the same time, we, we've, got, we've also got other targets from other parts of the Scottish Government on, on each two, uh, decarbonisation of housing. So the, the need for a, a balance and alignment of what's achievable and where resources are going to come from uh, to achieve our uh, joint objectives. And also, 
and there's a need to look at alternative ways of, of, of working uh, and coordinating actual other public sector organisation. For example, I know NHS has some significant recruitment issues and need, the need to get more staff from a lot of them from overseas into the country and, and, and they need housing. And this is another sort of dimension uh, to the challenges um, that we have. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that. I don't know if, if uh, Gary wants to come in. That. And I'll probably ask you the same question in terms of the scoping that's been carried out by local authorities, in terms of the detailed costs or an estimated costs at that stage of where are local authorities in, in, in that regard? Because I think obviously that would be the first step in terms of, you know, obviously mentioned about the federation, but also causal in terms of looking at detailed plans in terms of that. So I don't know how how far that works progressed within local authorities. Uh, yeah. So coming on that, chair, I, I suppose I think. Local government probably welcomes the targets of more homes and, and better homes around decarbonisation. But your, your your question for me gets right to the heart of the issue of of the assessment of the affordability of those targets and uh, and absolutely focusing on the affordability of rents for tenants being uh, for me the starting point. I, I think it's fair to say um, probably still in the foothills of really getting into the nitty gritty of that assessment and what is deliverable with the resources and the current level of subsidy from general taxation uh, and, and ultimately um, either tenants pay through the rents or taxpayers pay through through government subsidy um, I, I haven't we haven't done a local assessment on that um, but um, and I haven't seen any national assessments in terms of whether these targets are really deliverable and what trajectory that would bring to to rents and of course our tenants now facing all sorts of pressures around their their, their cost of living, and um, uh, that you know the, the the affordability of rents will differ across the country, and will have shifted um, since the programme targets were set um, through Housing 24, etc. So um, I, I think for me that's the the issue that now all local authorities and and, and layers of government now need to turn to their attention to of uh, what. What are the implications of the targets, and, and what are the calculations that sit behind the deliverability of those targets? Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I'm probably just going to bring in Professor Gibb. I know you, you spoke to us before about the report. I, I mentioned. I don't know if you've anything that you want to add to that in terms of just what you've heard, because I know you, you gave us a, an evidence, and I still remember that evidence yeah. session. You gave us and quote it quite a wee bit, but I don't know if what your thoughts are in terms of again striking the balance. Yeah, well, I think this. I think these are. This is the, the nub of the issue for me. It seems. I think uh, I, I always when I talk to students about this. Also, there's like three issues here. There's, there's uh, using rents to contribute to the new build program, using rents to contribute to decarbonisation, using rents to contribute to asset management and housing quality standards sorts of issues, and that puts tremendous pressure on on the affordability of rents going going uh, ahead, and that's obviously very concerning. I think. Uh, we are at quite still quite an early stage with the decarbonisation process. So I think landlords are putting a lot of time and work into what they view as a necessary but, but you know, really important and risky activity in terms of decarbonisation. I've been in debates before about decarbonisation. One of the things that social landlords have said is that they worry about innovation risk. They, they worry that they will press ahead with an initiative with a certain kind of technology, and three years down the line, it's clearly not the best thing to have done, and they simply can't know that in, in advance. So, so that they're understandably uh, he hesitant. I think, as Aaron said, really important issues here are about the partnerships of funding and how, how we try to bring in new, new new partners or find new ways to have long-term funding for for this, which is a, a at a societal level. So it does seem it's a public policy issue, and maybe needs like people at the Scottish National Investment Bank to be. More, more, more and more involved, perhaps. But the, the, the other thing, and another thing, I'll say from sort of direct anecdotal evidence of one observation: the housing association I'm on the board of are working very hard to try to understand the, the sort of implications of, of doing each one and what, what might follow on from, from after that. So the, the, uh, the, 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 the review has been watched very closely. So I'll leave it at that. No, thanks, Professor. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Sharina would like to come ah, in right. as well. Yeah, Sharina. 
Thank you. So, in terms of the competing priorities for local authorities, I think um, several people have already pointed them out, but we do also have our capital investment programme. So, we're still working our way through bathrooms and kitchens that need to be um, replaced on a cyclical basis. We've obviously got the ish 2 standards that will be coming out in the decarbonisation. On top of that, we're then also trying to build new homes, all of which cost considerable sums of money. Um, and I suppose when we go back to our tenants and we ask, what do you want the priority to be? It's their homes. It's making their homes comfortable, warm, fuel efficient. Um, so that's think, where we need to look at the starting point is how do we best serve our tenants? And I know that the Scottish Government wants all of the new build homes to be built by 2032, 110,000. But with the best will in the world, local authorities and RSLs cannot do all of the priorities and meet all of the timelines and the targets. So I suppose our question is, what does Scottish Government want the priorities to be? But we also need to take into account that we are landlords. And at the end of the day, we should be listening to what our tenants say and making sure that their homes are as best as they can be, that they're energy efficient. I think also one of the other points is the just transition. We need to remember that across the 32 local authorities, we've got quite a few will have mixed tenure stairs. Um, and that poses another issue for those tenants um, where they are a minority in a block getting um, renovations done to their home to make them as energy efficient as possible. And how do we make sure that those owner occupiers and private landlords are able to participate in this in an affordable way? Um, Another point, again, going back to our tenants, is that all of these additional costs will have to be picked up in some way by tenants. And we need to remember that our tenants are in the least kind of, they are the least able to pick up large rents. Um, Professor Gibbs' point is out there that, you know, we do all have apprehensions about the infrastructure and um, all of the different technologies that are coming out. And are our tenants being pioneers or used as, I suppose, guinea pigs to see which one works best? And how do we future proof that costs additional money that in the next 10 years, we're not going to think, oh, crikey, we shouldn't have used air source, now hydrogen or whatever it may be is the preferred model. So I think it's all of those different risks that we're trying to, to take account of. But we must not forget, tenants are at the heart of what we do, and we need to make sure that they are coming on this journey willingly with us and that this isn't being done to them because it's a lot of upheaval. Um, you know, potential decants, if we're putting back in hot water storages, they're losing a cupboard. I know it's small things, but that's how people enjoy their homes. Um, and the other point about fuel poverty, obviously, at the moment, there's it's never more acute in our minds the fact that we have got tenants who will be in abject fuel poverty. And we will have a lot of vulnerable tenants who will need a lot of additional support. And we must not forget those tenants as well, who are perhaps disabled and are using um, equipment, oxygen that needs to be plugged in. You know, the, the ability to just turn off your electric and just not use it is not going to be there for them. So anything that we do to improve homes must not push our tenants into further fuel poverty. Thank you. Sheena, I'm conscious of time. My next question, I think most people have kind of answered this, was talking about to what extent is development of new affordable homes by councils and RSLs impacting on tenants' rents and their affordability? I think we've kind of heard probably more expansive in terms of that in regards to, obviously, um, retrofitting and so on and what impacts it has. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything, because I think... Most of the panellists have, have, have actually mentioned that, but Aaron, do you want to... And again... Yeah, Gary, and then probably Aaron. Just on the pressures of that, and where, where is the affordability line, if you like, for tenants? I don't know if... Aaron, probably first, and then Gary after that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, the, the rent, to, to the start, the rent the rent decision the housing association is going to have to take this year is, is the most difficult I think they've ever had to take. Um, you know, I think it is widely accepted that housing associations will raise their rents by significantly below inflation. Um, and, and that puts enormous pressure on business plans in a way that we've, we've not seen before. Um, so when you ally that with the decarbonisation agenda, with the, uh, with, with the new build, what, what we will see this year is, is money taken out of the business plan over the long term, which makes that harder. Um, affordability will be the key driving factor for every housing association when they make their rental decision this year 
and in, and in future years. Um, but ultimately, we are going to have to balance the pressure that that brings on the business plan over the long term, the, you know, the ability to repay finance, the ability to deliver on those ambitions that, that, that we've talked about. Um, but as I say, I think what we're going to see this year is significantly below inflation. We support our members extensively with their assessments of affordability. We've got an affordability tool that's provided by Housemark, which has all of the latest data on the cost of living um, and, and all of the decisions will be informed will be informed by that but as you can imagine that's putting out some you know some very difficult some very difficult figures this year mm. i think it's interesting that you know in in scotland in scotland i think it's a really positive thing we don't have government rent controls um for for the social housing sector and i think when you look at the stats across the uk scottish scottish social rents are lower than wales and england and i think that is as a direct result of there being no government in intervention actually because i think government intervention often drives uncertainty and can have unintended consequences of housing associations taking the maximum rent rise they can under that government policy whereas i think affordability has remained at the heart of rent setting in scotland in in, in a way that it hasn't elsewhere so i think it's really important that we protect that independence and we and we and we protect housing associations efforts to deliver on affordability we know that the lower rents in scotland dr drive lower poverty rates than other parts of the uk um, and housing associations will remain committed to that affordability yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you for that, Gary. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to refer back to the, ev the written evidence. Um, uh, in terms of the Affordable Housing Supply Programme grant, the, the evidence points to the trajectory of that in terms of the percentage share of new builds funded by, by government grant reducing. And indeed, I think in the evidence we point to potentially reducing to 34% or below. So the, the point I wanted to make is that the, the government subsidy for new affordable housing is, is on a downward trajectory per unit um, at a time when we are, uh, as, as social housing providers, can, addressing all these competing demands. Thank you for that. I don't know if anybody else wants to can convene on that. Um, Ken. Yeah, I, can, I just want to, I to really sort of build on what Aaron just said. Um, it's been really alarming the last week, I think, the, the plans in England to set a 5% rent cap across the social sector, which is, you know, uh, we have this long tradition in Scotland that government doesn't intervene and in have let rent structures flow, as it were, to, to a large extent. Um, that cap, that 5% cap might put quite a lot of pressure on, on people in, in other parts of the UK to do something similar. We need to be really clear about the the consequences that has that Aaron's just uh, put out. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Matt. Do, you, do you want to pick up question 11 while you're, while you're on this? It's the question for, yeah. for, for Aaron. Yeah, and I think this, this one is for, the, um, for yourself, Aaron. It's in terms of the, uh, the tender price index for measuring an increase in prices. And you've kind of touched on this around about new affordable homes. Um, is there a more appropriate measure to use in terms of that? I think where, where I'm ambivalent about what the, what the measure is, I think it's really important that it that it picks up inflation in real time in in the current in the current circumstances. I've given you the stats on on yeah. development on you know on maintenance. We're seeing even even greater increases. So, um, 20 to 35 percent inflation over the year on on materials, 10 to 15 percent on labour, um, and we've had more than one housing association tell us that a like for like maintenance quote from last year has come back 50 percent higher this year. Um, so I think what's what's really important is, however Scottish government are assessing uh, inflation on on the benchmarks, that they're getting real time information. I think previously the Scottish Tender Price Index probably hasn't been uh, fleet of foot and hasn't picked that up quickly enough. But I do think, um, w as part of the benchmarks review, what we're seeing is uh, more proactivity from Scottish government in terms of getting getting that real time information directly from housing associations, and I think they are developing a fuller picture now than they've had previously. So hopefully that moves. Um, one of the challenges around, around the benchmarks, I have to say Scottish Government have been incredibly flexible and incredibly helpful in the current circumstances because more and more, more, and more bids are coming in for, for funding way above benchmark and, and Scottish Government have genuinely fulfilled the spirit of the, of the previous review. Um, the next, the review of the benchmark level isn't due until the end of this financial year, um, by which point they are going to be entirely out of keeping with, with where they were when the, when the cabinet secretary announced them previously. So, I think there's something about what are the triggers, what are the triggers for reviewing those more quickly, um, and that means that information you're getting needs to be live and needs to be much more, um, yeah. you know, much more real time. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Camille. Great, thanks very much. And um, now I'm going to go to questions from Willie Coffey. 
Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to, to everyone. I, I was hoping to pick up a few issues um, in East Eastshire Council's submission and pick on Mike and Gary <laughs> from COSLA just to see whether some of the issues raised in my council's submissions are reflective across across Scotland and uh, shared by our, our COSLA representatives. I think one of the one of the big messages that came out of that submission for me, uh, Mike and Gary, was that. East Ayrshire was talking about the decision really whether they should invest in existing stock or, or new build, and it's clearly a choice that many councils are going to have to face. Um, so th they, they were saying that, in fact, they said that it's untenable to consider both strategies <laughs> without uh, an ongoing assessment of the impact of borrowing and all the factors that colleagues around the tables have mentioned so far. Is that view that it's effectively untenable to do both shared by yourselves as COSLA representatives and spokespersons? I'll just maybe come in first. Um, I think essentially each local authority, you know, always have priorities and, and there's obviously a need for affordable housing, but there's also a need uh, to maintain existing stock, and that's obviously looking at upgrading where necessary, but also looking at decarbonisation um, initiatives too. But you know, bottom line is, so local authorities have obligations though, to, the, to their tenants um, in respect of their their properties. So it, it is it's really quite a hard ask actually when when a local authority is in a position where. It has to, you know, ensure that existing housing stock is uh, well maintained, is upgraded where necessary, um, as a landlord, which is only to be expected. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's 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 obviously looking ahead where there's a need to provide more affordable housing in a, in a local community. So it, it, it's really quite a, a, a tough position, and I think East Ayrshire's the submission is quite reflective of probably quite a, quite a number of local authorities across Scotland um, who are, are in that position. Uh, financially, with local government finance, obviously public sector funding thinning, and uh, all the other financial pressures that um, local authorities are under uh, in respect of a, a range of other priorities for housing. Um, so I'm not sure if Gary wishes to add to that. Um, yeah, thank. I suppose under the current funding models, uh, untenable sounds probably a, a fair assessment. The, the significant costs that have been evidenced on, um, and, and, and reported around the um, zero carbon um, agenda for social housing, along with the, the continual upgrade of, of housing, along with building more houses, um, without having a, a very adverse effect on rent levels, it, it would be be, be untenable, I think, to do to do them all, um, and I think it comes back to the discussion that's been this morning about um, um, the affordability of rents to tenants and, and what those rents can sustain in terms of any form of capital investment, um, whether it's more uh, investing in more homes or or in, in better homes through that investment, uh, and therefore it comes to the question of the level of government subsidy through general taxation that is brought to the table to support those. Those in, the, those investment demands, um, and, and I think that's the the conversation that really hasn't a mature conversation around that hasn't happened and, and really needs to happen around the 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 what is deliverable within the funding models and what needs to change in the funding models to, to achieve the ambition that everybody has. Thank you for that. They, they, they were saying that uh, they feel, of course, that it's more important to build the house types that the local, the local community and population needs, rather than hitting perhaps a target of a numerical target of 110,000 across Scotland. Does, does that ultimately leading us to where we will end up? We, we, we perhaps won't hit that target. We will focus on local needs. And they also mentioned the difficulty in replacing or building some of the larger properties that were lost during the right to buy years and so they being more expensive to build would impact on our ability to deliver on a numerical target. So is that kind of concern shared across other authorities in Scotland, would you say? Both Gary and Mike. Happy to come in there. 
I suppose it perhaps demonstrates through, through some of the earlier questions when we talked about wheelchair accessible housing. And I, I suppose it's back to that: what's a local housing needs assessment, and what kind of houses are required, rather than focusing the target on a, a, an absolute number of houses. I think just to add what Gary said, I think he's absolutely correct. Um, each local area has different um, demographics. Um, we'll have some areas that where we need more uh, specialised housing for people with disabilities, uh, older older people at the demographics, and particularly in a, in a, in a local authority area. Um, so it really is trying to balance that and try to. Addressing that issue for, for, for each local authority um, area um, and, and come to a local local solution. I think um, we, as I say, we've got again, continued challenges in housing right across Scotland as local communities, and we ever more. Um, I think it's something we will want to strive to uh, uh, achieve targets, and uh, we're kind of look to work with Scottish Government and other stakeholders to see if we can, uh, more can be built. But it's looking at, as Gary rightfully said, the financial challenges of, of, of this and you know what can be done to um, uh, achieve that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other comments made by the authority was concerning the grant levels. And Darren, I think, mentioned the flexibility that the Scottish Government has already shown in that, where if a council provides sufficient evidence, then it's Hopefully, granted, and that, that, that funding can be made available. But I think East Ayrshire said it's a kind of on a site by site basis or project basis. Is there is there an issue in there that we need to to improve and make that a bit more seamless? Do you think? Chair, happy to come in. Uh, I suppose the, the the issue with with benchmarks and and, and the, the lack of parity between RSLs and and, and local authorities means. I suppose one there's a disincentive to bring forward sites that may be well above benchmark, and, if, and, and secondly, if you do, there's a, an additional administrative burden in terms of going through through that assessment. So it's a it's a, a more complex process to secure the, the subsidy. Um, so so that that well, at best, it delays sites coming forward and delays sites going to construction. At worst, it means sites don't come forward. That, that with a higher level of subsidy might have been financially uh, made viable. Well, there's a couple of people who want to come in. Okay. Okay. So, um, Fiona, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I think the the whole issue and, and the word that you used of untenable is, is a word that that I'm hearing a lot from from members at the minute. If we look at it from the, from the point of view of the of the home builders, um, there's so w w we represent. Uh, private home builders and RSLs, and we estimate that together um, our members deliver. So, of the 6,000 ish affordable homes delivered last year, about 5,000 of those were delivered by our members. So, that either came through a Section 75 contribution from their private house building arm or as a contractor. And if we look just at that contractor side, so that's the contracting arm of larger home builders. And over the course of August, we were asking all of our members about the issue about affordable housing. Now, responses from those contractor arms came back and said to us that next year they are estimating between a 10 per cent and 30 per cent reduction in the number of homes that they will build as a contractor for RSLs and local authorities next year. One of them went as far as saying they estimated there would be a 100 per cent reduction. Now, that reduction is as a result of them being unable to enter into contracts which are simply unviable. Now, whilst we accept that the government has, is able to show some flexibility in terms of the, the contracts, the sheer pace at which inflation is going at the moment means that it's often impossible to enter into a fixed price contract because the suppliers won't fix their prices. So what we're left with then is um, as we've heard, the, the very well articulated reasons why RSLs and local authorities are unable to pass additional rent costs onto their tenants, and that's fully understandable. The rest of that risk then is often sitting with the contractor. 
and the contractors are now in a position that they're saying, we can't take that risk either because it will put our, our businesses under. So a number of them have come back and said anywhere between a 10%, 10% to 30%, and in one instance they said no, they were just moving out of that market completely. So, and that's, that's quite worrying in terms of the overall numbers of homes that we're talking about needing to be delivered. Okay. Sharina, you, well. you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, picking up on Fiona's point there, that's exactly what our local uh, our local authorities are seeing. Uh, the tenders are not coming in at fixed price. Uh, we are cautious and obviously risk adverse and will not want to proceed with projects that are unviable um, and almost go ahead with them and then ask for forgiveness after we've overspent and hope that we get um, money um, paid back to us. So we will be cautious and, and like my colleague Gary said there, that it will mean that we don't want to, or we are not able, I shouldn't say don't want to, we're not able to take forward projects. Um, one of the other constraints as well that none of us have picked up on is land. Um, local authorities have what land they've got available, um, and being able to buy any additional land up against other people in the open market means that we're probably very unlikely to buy uh, more land and where we do buy it, it may not always be in the places where people want to live or where it's needed. So those are all of the other issues that local authorities are trying to contend with when it comes to pulling together the, their programme for affordable homes delivery. Um, so yeah, I, I think going back to um, one of the other points there about local authorities saying it's untenable to build, that's definitely the feeling of um, the members that I've been speaking to. Um, if it's not untenable, then it certainly means that there will be a slowdown in the delivery of new affordable homes. Uh, that's definitely the sentiment that, that I'm hearing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Shirley. Just one last final query, I think, from a COSLA colleagues, if they're still, still online. Um, it's reported that the, the UK government might uh, be thinking about introducing the right to buy, bringing back the right to buy for housing association homes and uh, East Ayrshire made a specific response about that, saying that they would consider that that could make the situation worse, especially in the current climate. Is that, is that view shared by our friends and colleagues from COSLA? Mike? Well, I think I brought that. Th thanks. That's a really good question. I think it, um, you know, as an officer, um, I, Agree with that position in respect that that's the causal factor of that will uh, mean that there'll be less housing stock available uh, and social rent and, and then this is an area that we need to actually in, increase our capacity and, and investment and availability of. So yeah, that would have negative um, implications. Um, certainly for if it was a local authority, but for housing associations as well, the, the less social housing that. Uh, availability across Scotland. Um, so, no, uh, this is something that wouldn't be um, particularly, uh, wouldn't be at all uh, desirable. Thanks. Aaron. Yeah, just coming on, on the point around right to buy, I would, I would agree entirely with what, what Mike has said there. And I think, you know, there are a number of people living in, in social housing who aspire to own their, their own homes. Um, and it's really important that they are provided with a range of home ownership options. So we could do much more of things like shared ownership, which staircase people up to full ownership of those homes without losing social housing stock. So I think the reintroduction of the right to buy, be that for local authorities or for housing associations, would have a detrimental impact on our ability to meet the needs of, of those, in, those in poverty and those who require social housing. Thank you very much for that. Happy to hand back to other colleagues. Can Thanks you? very much, Willie. Uh, so we're now going to move on to questions still on the same theme from Marie McNair. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, panel. It's great to see you, and thanks for your time. Um, I think my first question has been touched on, but um, I'll continue to ask it to see if there's anything further more to be said. But what impact will the reported uh, rises in services uh, among small and medium-sized house builders have on the local delivery of affordable homes? And I'll put that to yourself, Fiona, first, and anyone else who would like to add to anything further. OK, thanks very much. I think, as, as we've already touched on, there is undoubtedly going to be a reduction in the number of homes that, that, that's being built. It's a simple um, B 
basic economics and uh, or mathematical equation, um, as you were. And, and we know that definitely the, the impact is being felt with um, with SMEs. I think what's important to to emphasise is the the social and economic value that we put on delivering homes of all tenures. That. Um, so we estimated that in, in 2019, approximately 22,000 homes were built in Scotland ac across all ten years, um, and that contributed about 3.4 billion GVA to the to the Scottish economy, supporting se over 79,000 jobs uh, per annum. So a reduction in the number of homes that's being built directly impacts on a the housing needs of the country, but also then on the social and, and economic. Um, contribution that home building can make, and it, it's, I think it's it's worth recognising that 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 is across all tenures. So, so we know that around around about seventy five percent of the affordable homes built last year, um, sorry, around about thirty percent of the affordable homes were built directly as a contribution through Section seventy five. So, as a direct result of the number of private homes that's being built. So, if the number of private homes that's being built falls directly then the number of affordable homes that will be built will also fall. So I think it's really important that, that we look at the overall contribution of housing of all tenures and what that makes to the society and economy of Scotland, particularly as when, when we're going into, into tough times ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really important issue. In many respects, what seems to be happening to the SME seems, sector seems to be symptomatic, really, of... of of other worrying concerns. I'm beginning to sound very depressive here, but um, a lot of housing commentators are predicting a housing market downturn now. I know mm -hmm. house prices are still rising 8 to 10% uh, a year, there. but mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be mounting evidence that that uh, will be reversed, that transactions will fall and that prices may fall too. And that as Fiona's really just been saying, uh, does have direct effects on the economy. If we know that house building, house construction, housing activity in general has large mul multiplier effects, that works re in reverse as well if uh, that is, dry is drying up. So I think uh, we do seem to be in this peculiar position of having uh, in our generation unprecedented inflation and at the same time we seem to be moving into a, a, a recession with many global factors behind it uh, as well. And that's, that's going to have impacts on the housing system as a whole. And uh, it will probably lead to UK government intervening, probably through things like stamp duty, uh, which is the, the go-to policy. Mm -hmm. It's not particularly brilliant or clever policy, but that's what they often seem to do because it's the easiest thing to do. But if people aren't transacting, it's not going to make that big a difference. So it's, it, it, I, I think we do need to think about this in this bigger context. Another thing that will have a big impact on shaping the future of the affordable supply programme is the ability to uh, build social housing when the market's finding it more difficult than it is presently, even though what Fiona's just been saying, it's, it's, it's not easy at all just now. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in? I'm going to move to my next question. OK, my next question, I'll direct it to Ilsa Rayburn. Um, your submission states there's an unnecessary complexities in the funding and planning processes which, if addressed, could speed up the process and enable more communities to deliver hyper-local schemes that meet local, local need. And you've touched a bit on that in an earlier response, um, but can you expand on that and maybe suggest any improvements that could be made? And that's to Elsa. Elsa, can you hear us? Here we are. Elsa, did you hear the question? Uh, sorry, I'm having really bad connection issues this morning. I've just gone off. So I'm using my phone, so I'm, apologies if it's not very clear. Um, but I did hear the question from um, Ms McNair. So in terms of um, uh, opportunities to speed up and make the process easier for these hyper-local schemes, access to land is an issue, which is all within this, part, uh, with this committee's remit, in terms of ensuring that communities have better access to land through the community land by land reform legislation. 
um, funding, uh, obviously Royal and Life Housing Fund and, and the continuation of that was extremely welcome. Um, and the Royal and Islands Housing Team, as, as has already been referenced in, in other conversations, are incredibly helpful in trying to bring schemes forward. Um, but there are issues over how the fund works and with small tweaks to the fund around um, the benchmarking and feasibility from the stage one. Um, and also um, at the moment, it's not, the fund is not, um, uh, taking account of the needs and energy efficiency targets, so communities are having to find additional funding um, to secure that. Um, and then some of the conditions can be too prescriptive on tenancy and tenure type, and have the need for mixed tenure actually making a lot of the schemes, and particularly place making um, based schemes work. Um, it's also very time consuming um, and the way it works in terms of community having to get to a fully tendered cost stage before they get confirmation of their stage two funding is extremely expensive for communities, often difficult to achieve. Um, so there are things that can be done in terms of changes to the housing fund and the way it works, really and tweaks, I think really substantive. Um, I think the, the intermediary organisations like community housing, community housing are absolutely critical in the um, process because, um, as all of the other um, participants will know, um, developing housing is a very complex and technical process and, and communities don't tend to have those skills. Um, so bringing in those intermediaries and supporters is really helpful um, to um, contribute to making projects going forward. And then we've also touched upon the role of planning, um, and particularly the point that Aaron was making around um, housing being seen as key infrastructure um, in NPF4. That was certainly the focus that we made in our submissions to NPF4, um, that housing is one of the building blocks of a successful Scottish economy, and that's not reflected in NPF4 at the moment. So hopefully, again, um, when the committee comes to hear um, the NPF4 um, uh, progress, and that point can be made. Um, so I think there are a number of issues around land supply, around funding, around planning, and about support for communities, all of which are within um, remit without huge additional resources um, required to being invested. Um, the issue around contractors and skill shortages you've already touched upon at length, but again, um, communities are looking for very local ways of trying to address that. Um, and often, obviously, they're working on very small four, six, eight unit schemes, which are much more deliverable by very local contractors rather than perhaps the larger scale ones that most of the RSLs are dealing with. Thank you. Thanks, Ilsa. Um, Fiona, your submission says that some house builders have and will consider projects and viable. You've touched on that earlier on in your earlier contribution, but can you provide a bit more detail on that and what can the Scottish Government do to address this? Okay, well, the, the, the issue about unviability is that a large amount of it com, comes down to, um, as we've touched on, this issue about um, risk sharing and, and, and where, who shares the risk for, for the unprecedented cost inflation that, that, that mm. we're seeing at the minute. The supply chain won't fix their prices. Therefore, it's more difficult for the contractor to fix their prices. Um, therefore, the RSLs, local authorities, understandably, don't want to enter in, into those contracts. So, th so the whole the whole thing um, comes down. I think there's a there's an opportunity for Scottish government to maybe consider some form of, of risk sharing or, mm -hmm. or un underwriting some some of that, um, some kind of risk pot that 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 might sit in a in a contract. Um, that if you know if, if price rises go over X percent, then if, then everyone takes a, a percentage share of of that. So if you share in reward, you, you share in risk as as well. So I think there's maybe some something around there. I think certainly um, accelerating, or improving the overall operating environment for for building homes, um, and speeding up the process as, as was touched on previously there. Um, Planning applications for for major developments for for housing currently sitting at around about 54 weeks. Um, now that's that's simply not acceptable. Um, we were talking with an SME um, just last week, who has three housing sites in the pipeline at the moment, um, in the in the planning pipeline, and they have a number of sites that are coming to an end shortly. With those um, forthcoming sites being subject to continual. Uh, um, delays in the planning um, cycle. They're now considering um, what they can do with their workforce and there's, there's a risk of workforce having to be laid off if they can't guarantee continual work streams. So I think there's, there's a number of things around the, the overall policy environment that is seen to be 
more supportive and rec recognising of housing as, a, as an economic and social contributor. And again, that's areas where, where government um, can intervene. And this has been touched on already, not with them, um, not necessarily require, requiring substantial um, investment at this point. Thank you. One final question, um, Professor Gibb. In your submission, you put uh, the scale of the challenge in context, including as you say, the working through the economic change associated with Brexit. Can you expand on this and say a bit more about the impact of Brexit? Well, I guess I'm thinking about uh, work that's been done by construction industry academics about, about the initial impact on, on labour supply and on uh, uh, materials costs and actually the shortages of specific ma 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 materials. But Brexit is a contributory factor at least to mm. our exchange rate and our external competitiveness. So if we're importing supplies, mm. there are negative impacts in, in that sense as well. And, and I think there's a, if you think through the, the entire supply chain that, that builds or invests in homes, there's, there's a lot of, there's clearly labour supply short, shortages which are quite mm. severe now. And I think we're all aware of that. And whether one attributes that solely to Brexit or not, it's certainly a, a contributory factor. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. We're now going to move on to theme three, which is about the scope for different ways of financing and delivering affordable homes, uh, priorities of resources if capital funding is under pressure. And I'm going to bring in Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, we've had quite a negative conversation, really, to, to this point in terms of where the market is. And I wondered, um, looking for so solutions to this and ways of trying to make sure that we can achieve the targets um, we've signed up to, I just wondered, in terms of financing, uh, where the panel members thought there was new opportunities and specifically um, to leverage more money into the, the sector. So I wondered, looking at longer term investments, for example, pension funds investing in housing schemes, where the panel thought there was maybe different models available to, to help to try to realise the potential we, we want to see in terms of housing and construction. Um, Fiona, I'll maybe bring you in to start. Okay. Um I, th I think it's, it's undoubtedly that this is the time now where we do look to be um, being a little bit more innovative um, around it. I think there's definitely more opportunity for um, shared ownership and shared equity um, schemes to support um, people. Um, I think also um, things like the First Home Fund um, that was um, was very successfully operated um, last year, again helping towards the aff affordable end of the of the market. I think what's particularly interesting with, with that type of loan funding is that it's generating income ultimately for government to allowing them to, to reinvest mm -hmm. in it. So I think that, that kind of approach. Um, and um, yeah, I, th I think there's, there's a lot more um, innovation that certainly um, a number of our members see coming from um, south of the border. And so I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but as I understand it, it's to do with the way that RSLs north and south of the border can, can borrow. Now, I'm, I'm sure other colleagues can advise on that, but from what I'm hearing, there's certainly a number of, of other more innovative approaches that they are able to do as a result of different borrowing structures. I don't know whether anybody else can, can come in on that. Yeah, I'm happy to come in. I, th I think I'll, tr I'll, try and, I'll try and be a bit more positive on this one, but I, th I think um, in terms of kind of what, what else might be out there, you do see in, in England and, and increasingly in, in some associations in Wales increased institutional investment, so access in the bond market. Pension funds have been something that have been mentioned kind of repeatedly during my time in housing that, that haven't quite got there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there have, there, have been, there have been some examples of it, but what it really needs is scale, and what all of these models really need is scale. So there needs to be collaboration and partnership within housing association sector to get there, and I think it's a question of how government, the regulator and others can help drive that. I think probably where there's the, the greatest opportunity for, for innovation around finance is probably in decarbonisation. And I talked about some of the pressures earlier and where, where they would apply to housing association business plans and, and business models. I think the interesting question is, can we get some of the lending that would be required off balance sheet? So is there a special purpose vehicle we could set up? Could we use, for example, the National Energy Agency as a facilitator of some of that funding? I think Ken mentioned you know, um, the Scottish National Investment Bank, Scottish Futures Trust. I think there's a role for some of those bodies in coming together and potentially providing a vehicle that that lending doesn't sit on housing associations uh, balance sheet. It doesn't affect our ability to build in the way that I've talk talked about. I think there's definitely an opportunity there and that's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. yeah, 
I, I mean, I think there are there are a few smaller innovations which can be useful in certain contexts, and we could do more with them. So, I completely agree with what Fiona said earlier about risk pots and things like that. I remember talking about that in the last time we, we were we, well back in about 2008, 2009. We were talking about other things to help provide state different forms of state support, as, as it were. Uh, a couple of other things. I mean, another thing that we talked about then, which still seems relevant now, is, is uh, buyers working together to try to uh, use purchasing power in that way to mm -hmm. try and get some, uh, again, at scale, trying to get you know uh, benefits out of that in the supply chain. I think uh, something that I've been working on recently in England, which is really interesting, is the social investment finance, uh, where. Uh, they, working in partnership with the Ministry in London, are doing a series of follow-on projects related to, to homeless people who were brought into hotels and such like during the, the lockdown. And they are working with a range of housing associations and other cha charities, and they're putting that, f that funding into to purchase pr properties for, for that purpose, sometimes for temporary accommodation, but, but high quality temporary accommodation, a lot of it's in the second-hand market. And I know that the Simon community and University of Edinburgh are working on a similar, uh, similar project in Scotland, and uh, I think it's a, it's a source of funding which is, there's, there's considerable appetite out there for it, and mm -hmm. I think it's something that we should set, it's not, it's not panacea, but it, it can be useful for certain things, particularly in the, the, the bits in the middle, if you're trying to you know, rely on a, a finite amount of housing support to back housing first and other things like that, then this might be another way that you, you actually help those kind of projects uh, uh, work. So I think all of those things are relevant. The other thing I think is really interesting is that, and it's difficult because financial transactions capital is, is to some extent demand-led and we, it's difficult to plan. There's quite a lot of it in the capital budget, mm -hmm. but it's been really vital to shared equity and to other things of that kind, to the charitable bonds model and things like that. And I think uh, there is examples, both through Scottish Futures Trust and places for people of affordable rent projects which work very effectively using without using pension funds and using financial transactions capital. And like we are seeing earlier, it has the added advantage that it's sort of, it can be a revolving fund and you can use it again mm -hmm. when you get your uh, share back. Yeah. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Is there anyone online wants to come in on on that point? No. Um, I wanted to also ask, with regards to um, Homes for Scotland, have suggested around government support schemes, and we know that we've seen the scrapping of help to buy in Scotland. Now, if we are heading into a period where you know people being able to find a deposit to buy a home is going to be more difficult. Um, where do you think uh, Scottish Government need to move, you know, for example, putting that scheme back in place um, to help people to get that, that deposit? Or is there a different model, again, um, for private buyers to maybe look at um, supporting, uh, to keep building private homes as well? And we've heard your concerns with regards to 30% um, of homes, of, uh, of affordable homes being provided and socially rented homes being provided by actually a strong private build. So I um, just wondered in terms of help to buy support schemes, what the view was in terms of the future of those and different models we should look at as well. Yeah, I think undoubtedly as, as we go into uh, more uh, more turbulent times that I think something like, um, like help to buy and the first home fund um, could be useful again. I think what, what differentiated the help to buy fund um, in Scotland than, um, than elsewhere was the fact that it was much more targeted in, in Scotland in terms of its threshold. So I think therefore um, will have had much more positive impact. So I think something that looks at that, but undoubtedly the, the first home fund, as, as I touched on earlier, the, the whole interconnectedness of, of the market, that if we, can get, if we can get the first home buyers starting to move there, the first part of a chain in terms of the, the, the private um, home, homes for sale. So something that can help stimulate that, that, first, home, um, that first home fund. Um, something interesting that we have talked about previously um, with regards to LBTT, no, no, as, as, um, as Ken said earlier, stamp duty can be a little bit of a blunt instrument, but I think there could be something around um, the use of LBTT and how we encourage that um, towards the purchase of, of greener homes. So can we link LBTT to, um, to more, the purchase of more energy efficient homes? Um, the same potentially for council tax as well. You know, is, is there a way of linking um, 
you know, potential reduction in council tax if, if you're buying more energy efficient homes. So I appreciate there's, there's bigger implications of all of those, but I think there are things that we could definitely be looking at. Interesting. Thanks. Any, anyone else want to come in on that point? Um, and just finally, in interest of time, um, I wanted to ask with regards to the UK government's levelling up and regeneration bill, uh, what the panel's view was on that and specifically around um, some of the missions which relate to housing within that. Um, there is obviously the, the example of by 2030, the UK government want renters to have a secure pathway to ownership. So just wondered if the panel had any views with regards to that bill and impact on devolved areas. If not, happy to hand back. <laughs> no one has picked up that levelling up front business yet. It's something that's coming towards us soon. Um, Willie wanted to come back with a supplementary on the kind of pension fund bit. And I think, Aaron, you were talking about the need for scale up. But, Willie. Aye, thanks very much, convener. It was just on the, the point that Miles raised about the use of things like pension funds or real estate investment funds to, funds to lever in, in, in money. Uh, isn't there a risk, as, as again my colleagues in East Ayrshire have said, that when you begin to do that and then you start to talking about guaranteed rates of return and perhaps indexing that, isn't there a risk that that translates across to the rent that might be demanded from tenants in that particular funding model and that rents might be required, required to be indexed in future using that funding model? Yeah, the, the de there definitely is a risk of that. I think, and, and I think ultimately that's one of the reasons that we haven't seen huge amounts of pension fund or, or that sort of institutional investment in the sector. I think where where we've seen, I mean, this is, this is clearly changing given the economic circumstances. Where we've seen returns on investment at historically low rates recently, actually that has raised the spectre of whether what social housing brings is certainty. Um, and whether that would become more attractive than higher rates of return and, and whether there's a trade-off there. I think ultimately both the scale and the fact that there haven't been huge returns have meant that hasn't gone there yet. And if we were to go there, we'd have to have to navigate some of that. It would be it would be a significant unintended consequence if we would see rent policy driven by investment rather than the other way around. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. Well that concludes all our questions. So thank you so much for um being with us this morning, I think I've certainly I've picked up quite a few things to go and look at. Sorry, what? Oh, sorry. Gary, you wanted to come in on that pension fund question, I think. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I suppose just to highlight to the, the, the committee that in terms of local authorities under our current funding model, our housing revenue accounts, we can secure uh, very quickly um, borrowing um, to fund investment from the Public Works Loan Board through Treasury. Um, and, and those rates are, you know, again, um, rates based on guilt, um, which support, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, support that whole fundamental issue of the affordability of rents. And it would be probably challenging for the private sector uh, pension funds looking for a, a return, which is going to be higher than the, the cost of borrowing that we see through PWLB arrangements. Thanks. Great, thanks. And Ken, you want to come in as well? tangential point, but I think it's very relevant to what Mr Coffey was talking about. We're doing some work in rent control, and one of the things that we've looked at is the investment banks in Europe and how they behave with in the presence of rent controls. And we talked to a Swedish uh, real estate business, and they have properties they invest in. They're investing on behalf of pension funds and insurance companies. They have properties in Sweden, in uh, Germany, in Denmark in Holland, uh, as well as in the UK, and they, they're quite happy to operate in rent-controlled systems where clearly rents may not be able to be indexed, but they, they work it out and they, they work through it and they, they look at a series of risks, and as part of a diversified portfolio, it seems to work quite effectively. And I think when, when there's so much, uh, you know, again, this is not really on point, but when there's so much... Uh, discussion made of, of, of supply withdrawal and investment problems attached to rent control models. It's interesting to see how real estate businesses actually operate in that context and actually kind of export their model into countries with different kinds of rent control and do it quite successfully. Thanks for bringing in that point, actually, and pointing us to there are other um, parts of the world that are doing things differently. Okay, Sharina, you want to come in as well? Um, yeah, so I suppose it's maybe just a, a bit of a caution around 
looking at all of these models and what does that mean for local authorities. So if local authorities were expected to take a 20, 30 year lease on a block of flats, we would probably be, based on other models that we've seen, expected to be responsible not just for the management and maintenance, but for the cyclical repairs as well. And then where do those tenants go after 10, 20 years? The blocks aren't going to be empty. So again, it then falls to the fact of having paid the rent and whatever return the um, owner wants, local authorities would then potentially buy the units or they would have to bring them back up to whatever then standard there is, which I assume um, will have changed in 10 or 20 years. So in terms of what the long-term investment and gain looks like for local authorities, it's not always the most beneficial in contrast to us just building our own homes and owning that asset outright. Thank you. Thanks very much for that point as well. So as I was saying, we're, I think we've come to time, exactly 11 o'clock, um, and um, certainly have raised some really good points. I think that I, I know I need to go and look at a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, so we're going to be taking evidence from on the same topic next week from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government on the 13th of September. And um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone who's contributed this morning to the discussion and colleagues. We agreed at the start of the meeting to take the next two items in private. So as there's no more public uh, business today, I now close the public part of the meeting.